Starting fourth, the scourge of Soldier Field, Chicago, back in the 50s, Tiger Tom Pistone. For fifth position, a 10-time Winston Cup winner, Cotton Owens, number six. Starting six on the field. They called him the Golden Boy out of Almerst, Illinois, fearless Freddie Lorenzen, who not only had to battle all those other teams of the 60s, but the mob as well. Carolina, now an admired broadcaster. The ninth position is Donnie Allison. Who will ever forget 1979? He and Kale right to the final corner at Daytona. Donnie, how serious are you going to be? You have any old debts you want to repay? Well, I'll tell you, you know, as competitors, uh, I don't think we ever get old. You know, we all want to win. I do. I know I want to win. Donnie, you've had some scraps with some of these guys out here in the past. Do you owe them anything? Well, I won't say I owe them. I've already said excuse me in case I were to hit them. Sounds like Donnie's ready for some bare-knuckle racing today. Starting 10th, the 40-time winner, 67-year-old Tim Flock. Remember that fabulous Hudson Hornet on the old beach course at Daytona? The 11th starting position is Little Bud Moore out of Charleston, South Carolina. And going 12th is 72-year-old Buck Baker, two-time Winston Cup champion. He always took the high groove. For row seven, it's the 1965 Rookie of the Year, Sam McQuay. Remember old 98, winning the Firecracker 400 at Daytona? And then in 1970, out of New England came this guy who won the Daytona 500 in both races at Talladega. The years have treated Pete Hamilton well. Further back in the field is the driver of car number 61. That's Haas Ellington. And alongside him will be number three, the 1960 Daytona 500-mile champion, 50-time winner, tied with Ned Jarrett on the all-time win list. That's Junior Johnson. The engines have fired. They're getting set to roll out. Field is moving. And let's review the rest of the starters here in the Battle of the NASCAR Legends. There's the 1962 Southern 500 winner, Larry Frank, and a 500-time starter, twice winner, Almo Langley. Further back, there's Neil Castles and Richard Childress, better known these days, as the owner of Dale Earnhardt's car. There's Paul Goldsmith, who won the last race run on the old beach course at Daytona. And then there's Smokey Eunuch, the all-time car builder. The editor of the National Speed Sport News was a track PA announcer with many of these athletes in bygone days. Chris Economac. Ken, these drivers have totally captured the hearts and imaginations of everyone at this racetrack. When champions like Rusty Wallace and Terry Labonte strain to get a glimpse of warm-up laps, you know this is something special. I can tell you this, I'm going to be right there and get a front row seat. I want to watch this. This is going to be interesting. Indeed, it has been a special 48 hours for these men. When they arrived here the day before yesterday, it was a festive, jovial, back-slapping reunion. How you been? Hi, sir. I read those orders. Yeah, oh, I've been just riding the airplane here for nights. Oh, yeah. yeah. Flying them around. Yeah. Good. Good. That was followed by a black tie dinner dance, where each of the legends was presented a custom-designed ring. After a fun-filled weekend, there was to be an old gentleman's stately cruise around the racetrack. But something funny happened on the way to the starting grid. They all found their old race faces and suddenly are ready to bump and run or do whatever it takes to rekindle that fire in the belly that made them champions of yesteryear. Get a firm hold on your armchair, because here they are, just moments from the start. Some of the greatest fence busters in the history of NASCAR getting ready to go racing one more time. Battle of the NASCAR Legends is brought to you by Champion Spark Plugs, the world's number one selling spark plug, no matter what you drive. And by Gillette and the revolutionary Gillette Sensor Shaving System. Gillette, the best a man can be. And by Food Lion, with extra low prices. Gillette presents Sensor, the system, the technology that will change the way you shave forever. Sensor, twin blades set on springs to read your face and respond. Independent suspension to sense and adjust to every curve of your face. No other razor comes close. 
Gillette Sensor for the best shave a man can get. Snickers Bar, the official snack food sponsor of the 1992 U.S. Olympic team. Packed with fresh roasted peanuts, thick milk chocolate, and caramel, Snickers satisfies the hunger inside you. Richard Petty, the only driver ever to win 200 Winston Cup races, all on champion spark plugs. Sure. Your help out here really does make a difference in the way I run. Well, Richard, this is our testing ground. It makes a difference in the way we build our spark plugs, too. They work for me in both my cars, whether I'm racing or going home. I depend on Champion spark plugs. Champion, no matter what you drive. You and I are about to see a very special event. To call all the action, here is a very special friend of mine, a legend in his own right, Ken Squire. Under threatening skies, the first battle of the NASCAR legends about to be turned loose. 22 drivers at the ready, crowd on their feet, excited, anxious to see this start among some of racing's greatest. Veteran starter Harold Kinder puts out the green flag one more time. And as they go to turn number one, it's car number 90. Richard Brooks out in front, down the inside, going for second place. It's the three-time Winston Cup champion, number 11, Kaylee Arboro for second, Cuckoo Marlin, number 14 in third. As they complete lap number one net, they're driving very respectfully out there. They might just be feeling out the damp track, Ken, or they might have taken the comments by Dick Beatty and the driver's meeting very seriously. It is the first time Beatty's been taken seriously in generations. Here you see Pistone running in fourth, the red car, and directly behind him, Marvin Panch in that blue machine. Another lap run faultlessly. Oh, spoke too soon. Yeah, there's Junior Johnson coming off the grass. No big surprise to see him down there doing that agricultural racing. <laughs> Up in front, car number 90, originally out of Porterville, California. Richard Brooks has the advantage with car number 11, Cale Yarborough in second. Sideways bumping up here in turn number four as they continue to get the feel of this tough quarter mile track. Of course, it's the same size as the old Bowman Gray Stadium in Western Salem, North Carolina. But here in Charlotte, there are a lot more seats and they're all packed. They've got a spin. That's Tim Flock. In the white car and Bud Moore in car number 29. And, and look at Hoss Ellington spinning out in front of them. That, that wreck happened behind him. He shouldn't have spun out. Tim Flock unable to start. Caution flag is out. Let's look again at what happened. Well, we're riding with Richard Childress, and he sees the car of Flock and Bud Moore spin in front of him. And there's the car number 61 of Hoss Ellington going around out of harm's way. Oh, they love it here. Chris? Well, gentlemen, by my watch, it took less than two laps and about one minute and 20 seconds for these guys to roll back the clock 30 years. Tim Flock has gotten older, but he hasn't changed his driving style one bit since he was sliding around the beach course in the 50s. And this is exactly what little Bud Moore predicted would happen today. I do believe it's going to be competitive. I mean, I, I, just the guys I've talked to, I mean, they're here to go racing. They're not here to go playing. Bud Moore was involved in that first incident out of the back of the field now in his car 29. Here you see Richard Brooks in front, Kaylee Arborough still lighting that second spot as we're back under green. Riding with Richard Childress here going down the back straightaway in this quarter mile. They're getting tied up in front of him. There's Cotton Owens about to spin in car number six. And he gets collected. Jam session in turn number three. Six of them down there. McQuag's in it. Well, about a third of the field then. Junior Johnson was involved in it. Tim Flock, Pete Hamilton, Larry Frank. There goes Junior Johnson. Let's take another look. Here's Junior really fighting it, trying to go by on the outside. But I wonder if his reaction time was what it used to be. Are you saying he should have run that groove a little higher, Ned? Well, I don't look like there was some room out there on the outside. Let's look again. Now, there's Cotton Owen spinning. Of course, he's frammed into, and there's Junior on the outside. Well, he might have got into the wall if he would have turned right, but there was some room out there. Well, that'll end Sam McQuag's day, and that's got to make Cale Yarbrough breathe a little easier. Sam and Cale's get-together at the 1965 Southern 500 in Darling was a tangle they still talk about in stock car racing. Cale remembers it this way. We were battling for the lead, and several
several times I got Hearn to Sam trying to get by him, and this one time coming down the front stretch, I got all the way up by him and went into the first turn side by side. Well, it's not much room at Darlington, you know, and we bumped a little bit, and when we bumped, my car got completely airborne, went over the top of Sam's car, over the guardrail, never touched it, out into the parking lot, end over end over end. Kel asked me today, I saw him, he said, you're going to drive in the race? I said, sure, he said, you're going to put me over the wall? I said, if you get it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pete Hamilton is one of the casualties of that six-car wreck, and he's not laughing all that hard. Neil Bonnet's down in the boneyard with him now. Pete, Larry Frank, you survived. Tell me what happened. I'll tell you what happened. They stacked up in front of us, and uh, I kind of just smoked on in there, and Larry, poor Larry, he was stuck in the middle, too. We kind of stacked him up like cordwood. I don't know what happened to him, but the doggone oil pump broke on mine in the crash, so that was it. Now, did that sound good, what Pete said? <laughs> he backed into me. He backed into me. I went down the corner and was right on his back bumper, and he backed into me. Pete done it. I'm telling you, I hear, I, I've heard that before. <laughs> Well, there's no doubt somebody done it. They're dragging Buck Baker's car off to the barnyard. Now, Buck's no stranger to crashes. Years ago, before cool suits and supplemental oxygen, Buck used to keep cool by swigging on a jar of enhanced tomato juice in his car. Well, one day he was involved in a terrible-looking crash, like this one at Darlington. The tomato juice jar broke and spilled all over him. The first rescue guy to the car looked in, spun right around, and ran back up the embankment to meet the ambulance crew. No use to hurrying, boys, he said. Buck's done cut his head clear off. We're under caution here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. At that driver's meeting this morning, when they called the roll, those that answered here were many of the pioneers who wrote the history of NASCAR. Donnie Allison. Here. But Baker. Here. Richard Petty and Food Line are celebrating 35 years in business. Right. And to commemorate Richard Petty's fan appreciation tour, Food Line is offering one of these four card packs before each of the 29 Winston Cup races. Each pack contains photographs of my career, plus a Food Line cover card for each track. They're available only at Food Lion and for only 99 cents. So before each Winston Cup race, pick up a pack from the spatial display. Watch it, Tom. That thing's dangerous. Oh, pizza cake! Rookies. In trying to make an artistic statement, one should be careful not to let one's personal aroma do the talking. In order not to offend the critics, I recommend Right Guard Sports Stick. It provides maximum protection and the freshest scents, a sublime palette of odoriferous emanations. After all, a true artiste should be remembered for his inspiration, not his perspiration. Right guard sports stick. Anything less would be uncivilized. Is that it? One second, son. To achieve superior results. Now? Don't be so impatient. You need superior tools. Since 1843, a company from New Britain, Connecticut, has been helping people do things right. Okay. Try it now. Finally. Stanley. All right. You know, someday these tools could be yours. How about the car, Dad? Stanley Mechanics Tools at leading retailers. The cleanup of that six-car pileup continues here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway in the battle of the NASCAR legends, scraping four of those wrecks onto the flatbeds. Let's go down to Neil Bonnet. Junior Johnson's got his car bent all out of shape. Crew might have a chance to get him back out before the wrecks are gone. I used to drive for Junior, and a couple of weeks ago, I went back to his place in the hills for a visit. We're fixing to drop off into the hollow. This is Ingle Hollow, North Carolina, where Junior Johnson race shops are located. Oh, trouble! Darrell Waltrip, the Junior Johnson Chevrolet, out of control, into the wall. The building over here on the right is the offices for Junior Johnson and Associates. They handle all the book work, the paperwork that goes along with running their, the race operation and the parts business is also involved. Ken Waltrip, hold on to the Junior Johnson Chevrolet and win this Talladega 500. This little area on the left, we can't bypass this. This is Junior Johnson's garden. As you can see, it's not quite ready. When I was up here, Junior plowed this thing with a mule. Poor old mule conked out. Junior's resorted to tractors now, so he's working the garden with a tractor. Neil Bonnet has entailed his 
Junior Johnson car on the pit. This is the main facility for them right now. This is where they take the cars in, get them ready, load them, take them to the racetrack, and see if they can't win some more races. In the last 10 years, Junior Johnson has been the most successful car owner in Winston Cup racing. In that time, he's won more races than Petty Enterprises, Rick Hendricks, the Wood Brothers, anyone you can name. His success formula is pretty simple. Junior's always trying to build a better mousetrap. I've always been a guy that cannot stand people saying, well, this won't work, or you can't do that. That's not true. If you work hard enough at it, you can just about accomplish anything you want to. That's been one of my uh, secrets to success, I think. I want to take a no in whatever I'm doing. I keep hammering at it till I get it fixed. By now, you figured out that Junior Johnson didn't graduate from MIT. Hey, but he could probably teach there. He's designed and built every part of a car, and he certainly taught Detroit a thing or two. Well, Neil, you raced for Junior Johnson. I had to race against him for about six and a half years, and I'll tell you, he was one of the toughest competitors that anybody ever ran against, and we had some knockdown, down drag-out type situation that made our cars look worse than his looks out there right now. Another driver I raced against is Tim Flock, whose car is a little worse for wear after that wreck. Last night, we were all at a party the Winston people threw for us, and Charlie Harville, one of the great announcers in racing, got Tim telling about when he raced with Jocko Flacco. Jocko Flacco ran in eight Grand National races with me. My car owner, Ted Shester, in Atlanta, Georgia, thought of buying an African monkey. He had little goggles built for him, a cloth helmet, a suit, had Jocko on it. And on my Hudson Hornet back in 1952, on his side of the car, we had Jocko Flacco, and on the driver's side, Tim Flock. On the eighth race, we was running a mile track at Darling, I mean, Raleigh, North Carolina. We had a trap door back then. We pulled the chain, you could see your right front tire. Jocko had been watching me pull that chain for oh, about 60, 70 laps. He got out under two belts, went down in that hole, and a pebble hit him right here, and he come running back up in the car and got on my shoulders. So I had to come in the pits, and it's the only time in history that a Grand National car stopped to put a monkey out of it. <laughs> and that's the truth. It, you, cost, it cost me $750. <laughs> it's going to cost these organizers more than $750 to fix these cars up from that monkey business in turn four. Look at Freddie Lorenzen getting ready for the green flag. Once the golden boy of the 60s, he had his share of problems before and after those golden years between 1961 and 67. When he won 26 races, including the Daytona 500 and the Coca-Cola 600. Chris? Well, Ken, Freddie tried to come back in the mid-70s, but had a nasty crash at Darlington. Of course, there's no shame in that. Everyone wrecks at Darlington. Now, lots of drivers' career end because of a lead foot. Freddie's almost ended in cement shoes. He was financing his racing by borrowing from some of the local citizens in the Chicago suburb of Cicero. That was in 1960. He was broke and desperately needed a big win in Atlanta. We started eighth and we're leading it in blue. When I got home, my father said, there's some guys can come over to pick up $10,000, Yoda. It was the mob, mob people from Cicero that I'd borrow money from. Had to sell everything. That was in September, November of that year. Ralph called me and says, uh, we want to give you a ride next year for the Holman Moody for 1961. So that was the big break of my life. And from then on, his career just took off. He became the rocketeer. And right now, he'd like to rocket to the front as we get ready to drop that green flag. And Dick Brooks still out front in car number 90. K.O. Yarborough right on his back bumper in the yellow car number 11. The red and yellow number 14 running third is Cuckoo Marlin, followed by Tom Pistone. And that blue car, Marvin Pan, stays fifth. Kim, let's take a look from inside the Richard Childers car on that restart. Donnie Allison in car number one really gets loose in that quick drive they put down. Richard now shifts up into third gear. They don't run in fourth gear on this size track. And this size track consistently gives us some of the best stock car action to be seen. Well, certainly they always run close together. Kale Yarborough making a bid for the lead, but really gets loose. Now we're inside of Kale's car. He takes a look to see how close someone is behind him. And here's Benny Parsons in big trouble. Somebody's changed the cosmetics on the front of his car. Pulling down on pit road, Neil Bonnet will try to get a word with him down there. Meanwhile, car number 90, Richard Brooks, pulls away and continues to build on that lead. Neil?
again. Benny's pulled his car and parked it in the pits. Let's see if we can get over here and have a word with him. Benny, what's wrong with your car? Neil, it seems like it's broken a right front road or something like that. There's some kind of noise up front. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get in the way of it. I'll tell you one thing, you're sure running good at the first race. I need to fix this thing. Yeah, it was running pretty doggone good. Uh, we'll have to see what happens with the laps that I missed. That's a... You think you were just working the car too hard, do you? They said you were really getting after it now. Oh, no, not really. Okay, Ben. Coming down to a scheduled caution flag here with Richard Brooks in front, Yarborough second, and maintaining third, Alamo Langley. So those drivers will get a break for a moment and get a chance to take a deep breath and then back for more. Dick Brooks. Hey. Paul Selling. Get hot deals for your wheels now at Z-Bar Tidy Car. Sunroofs, window tints, auto alarms, whatever you need to dress up. Well, so they may have seen at most two or three of the younger guys race. It seems like only yesterday that Kale and Donnie and Benny had their day in the sun. But for others, like Junior, Freddie Lorenzo and Tim Flock, it's been a quarter century of yesterday since they drove a race car. But just 24 hours ago, thousands of fans stood in 95 degree sun for up to three hours just to get an autograph. And these old codgers sat in that muggy tent for more than an hour after the session was scheduled to end. They wouldn't leave, so everyone who stood in line for an autograph got it. These battle-scarred old guys remain loyal to the fans, and they're also loyal to each other, even though they might have been bitter rivals in their racing day. And there's a fight between Cale Yarborough and Donnie Allison. Cale now had the misfortune of getting into a little scrape at Daytona. <laughs> Two weeks later, we got another one at Rockingham. Billy France Jr. decided that uh, we both need to be fine and uh, um, put on probation, whatever, and that didn't work. We still run into one another. <laughs> but you know what's happened? We still buddies. Have been all I our mean, lives. The best. <laughs> all our lives. <laughs> Ken and Ned make no mistake. These legends have stole a lot of thunder from today's stars on this race weekend. As a rule, the Winston Cup drivers don't like being upstage, but they know something special is really going on this weekend. Occasionally, I'll ask them a question about how did they handle certain situations or how did they go about approaching traffic when they saw a big group of cars running together. If it looked like there was a potential for a wreck, what did they do then? And, and uh, when they were out front, themselves. I like to listen to their answers on those things. I've learned some of the answers from, from those who have taught me what to do in, in today's situations. One lap to racing and trying to find the answer to how to make up a lap. There's the number three of Junior Johnson. I believe he's using the Winston Cup rules here, Ned, where you can line up two abreast. Unfortunately for this race, I thought it was a single file restart. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be, but Junior's making up his rules as he goes. He wants to do it his way. Coming down for a start. On the break, car number three, Junior Johnson making up the lap number 90. Richard Brooks is your leader. And Kaylee Arborough getting shoulder to the outside in turn number two, falling back two or three spots. Now we're inside of Richard Childers' car as he watches the action in front of him, just trying to find a place to go. And Kale continues to go back. Going up into second spot goes Neil Soapy Castles, Elmo Langley third. Pace car is coming back out, Ned. I don't believe NASCAR was too enthusiastic about that start that Junior Johnson made. Oh, here's number 64, Elmo Langley getting into the side of Neil Castles. And Soapy gets spun into the grass up here in turn four. But caution was already coming out. Let's take a look from inside Richard Childers' car as he sees the action in front of him. Elmo Langley bumps the car 06 of Neil Castles and sends him around down into the wet grass. Full contact stock car racing here in the battle of the NASCAR legends. And we're riding with Dumpling. That's what Flossie Johnson calls Junior. And now he's pulling alongside the pace car, apparently trying to converse with Bill France Jr., the president of NASCAR, who's driving the pace car. He actually touches him. No, he wouldn't touch the pace car. Well, I don't know. You can expect anything from Junior Johnson. He does touch him. <laughs> Junior Johnson in car number three, doing what every Winston Cup driver has always wanted to do, run into Bill France Jr. on a racetrack. Hey, 
Hey, what's happening? I'll tell you what's happening. They're going to stop the race. This looks like a typical Saturday night shootout. And they're holding the cars down here on the track while they get this thing ironed out. Let's take a look again at what happened. Okay, there's Johnson up beside the pace car, and he frams him, knocks France down into the grass area, and then Junior pulls away. Billy France is bailing out of that pace car. He's had all this he wants. And Chris Economac, I bet you're going to tell us that you've seen all of this kind of stuff before. Man, I don't have to tell you that back in the early days of stock car racing, these guys really would push the pace car out of the way to get started. Elmo Langley, who's running third down there now, drives the Winston Cup pace car now very conservatively. He was one of the more colorful characters on the track, a swashbuckler, so to speak, in the early days. He didn't win many races, maybe not, but boy, he sure left his mark. Or maybe I should say he left his dent on the sport. In fact, he's sort of the Baryshnikov of bumper bash. Now, the best was to get him going in the corner, tap him, give him a little boost where he goes out wide and get underneath of him. If you get underneath the back of him in his left quarter pound and try to turn him around, you're liable to get gathered up in it yourself. Now, if you really want to get rid of somebody, and you know, we used to get outside of a guy and wait till you heard him get back on it and then turn left into his right rear quarter panel, and that'd send him head on into the wall. You'd be you just eliminated for sure then, but uh, you didn't want to do that, too. You don't want to hurt nobody. You don't mind rubbing or spinning them or putting them out of the race to win a race, but uh, you know, you don't want to hurt nobody. You ready to lean on anybody? Oh, I sure. You know, this is supposed to be a legends race, and that's what we did back in those days. So, a little leaning, uh, we did a lot of that. So, you know, I don't mind that. You know, he's not as good as he was in the old days, but he's still good. Well, got a few years under his belt since then. That track is about ready for racing. When we come back, we'll have a green flag and a great race on the Battle of the NASCAR Legends. Tim Flock. Tiger Tom to Stone. Typical of liberal policies. We should have that mess cleaned up by now. Boys, let's go racing. Well, we're going to try to get this thing running once again. The battle of the NASCAR legends is indeed that here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Pace car is coming in, and as we set the field, car number 90. Out in front is Richard Brooks. And look at number 29. He scooted. I think he cheated his way up into third spot. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about it. He jumped the flag, and so did Tom Pistone. Now, they black flagged him. He has come in for a stop and go. I'll tell you, they've also black flagged Bud Moore, who's dealing with it like he deals with most things. Well, Cale Yarborough really fighting the wheel, trying to move up and around Dick Brooks, but Brooks just hanging on to the lead. That 29 of Little Bud Moore rapping, playing bumper tag with number 11, Cale Yarbrough, and the black flag is out for the 29. He's shot by about six cars in the start. There's Bud Moore getting sideways, and down to the bottom goes Richard Childress in number three, Almo Langley in the 64, and Donnie Allison in the one. They have Bud Moore pressed on the outside, and they're taking that bottom groove, getting by him. Look at that move again. Moore went into turn one too fast, slid a little high, and Richard Childress drives right on by. Now he brings his battered car number 29 into the pits. I guess he's obeying the black flag. Looks like he used that nose as a post mall out there. He's waving his hand saying, who, me? I didn't jump any flag. <laughs> hey, we've gone, uh, what, two laps? All this law and order? Ah, here comes the answer to that. That's Flock in the 300 and number three, Junior Johnson, going at it. And they're not even in the lead lap, are they, Ned? Boy, and look at both of those cars. Look like they've been in a demolition derby. But no, they're not in the lead lap, but still battling as hard as if they were battling for the lead. They touch a little bit there as we look out the windshield of Junior's car. Boy, watch him fight the wheel. He's serious about this. And he's running about 17th at the moment. He's trying his best to move around Tim Flock, and Flock knows how to hold him off. Boy, they get together there pretty good. Junior Johnson into the side of 67-year-old Tim Flock straightens him up, and here they come for turn one. Look at Flock, though. He's going to try to turn back into him. That could cost the Junior a tire out there. Caution coming back on the track for debris. I'll say about 18 rolling pieces of it out there right now. Take a look here. That is Tim Flock, two-time Winston Cup champion on the outside in the 300 car, and the number three, the 1960 Daytona champion. That's Junior Johnson down on the bottom. And boy, those cars really banged up. And the caution is out for the debris on the racetrack. I tell you, Ned, 
Junior Johnson's living by his own adage, go to the front. At all costs, doesn't matter who is in front of him or what kind of a car it is. I think he's going by the 1960 rule book. The rule book <laughs> that he wrote. And Junior Johnson is bidding. That right rear tire that Tim Flock caught is going down. We'll be back in a moment. Junior Johnson. Freddie Lorenzen. Richard Petty, the only driver ever to win 200 Winston Cup races, all on champion spark plugs. Jerry, your help out here really does make a difference in the way I run. Well, Richard, this is our testing ground. It makes a difference in the way we build our spark plugs, too. They work for me in both my cars, whether I'm racing or going home. I depend on champion spark plugs. Champion, no matter what you drive. Gillette presents Sensor, the system, the technology that will change the way you shave forever. Sensor, twin blades set on springs to read your face and respond. Independent suspension to sense and adjust to every curve of your face. No other razor comes close. Gillette Sensor, for the best shave a man can get. Snickers Bar, the official snack food sponsor of the 1992 U.S. Olympic team. Packed with fresh roasted peanuts, thick milk chocolate, and caramel, Snickers satisfies the hunger inside you. Back at Charlotte, battle the NASCAR legends. Here's a legend, Chris. Oh, Tim Flock seems a little the worse for wear. Luckily, he doesn't have to pay for his tires today. Back when Tim was racing for the championship, they raced on ordinary, narrow, skinny street tires, but the driver had to buy them. Sponsors didn't pick up all the bill. So Tim and some of the other drivers found an unwitting sponsor to supply their tires, called TARS in those days. You won't believe it, but we'd go buy some tires from Sears Bow Book, run them in a 100-mile race on a half-mile dirt track, wear them out, and take them back to Sears, get four more of them Monday morning. We've done that for years at Sears. It, I don't think they ever caught on what we've done. And here's Junior back in for some more tires to sell. Hey, guys, I wonder if he can take these four back down to Sears on Monday and get a new set. <laughs> you know, Junior was real serious about this race. Of course, Junior's real serious about every race he's ever been in. But he went out and practiced, especially for this race, and there was supposed to be no testing. He and Richard Childress rented the old Bowman Gray Stadium in Winston-Salem last week. It was supposed to be a secret, but Junior Johnson can't go anywhere in North Carolina that nobody knows about. It's been 26 years since I sat down on one of these things, but it's the beginning to come back to me about everything we, uh, you know, did before. We're starting to do back to get the car to handle and where it feels good and stuff, so it, it'll be a lot of fun. And Junior's getting ready to head back on the track again and again and again. <laughs> When Hubby Wheeler put this together, it was to be an all-star cast, not a lone star number by Junior John. And there's Junior spinning as he came out to get back under green. Tried to make it three wide going into turn three, and they haven't even found that they can go two wide around this little racetrack. We are staying under green here in the battle of the NASCAR legends at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. And here's the scene from old Dumpling's car. Maybe it should be bumpling on that uh, sign inside his car. Junior Johnson spinning in turn number three. And although he's lapsed down, he's still having a heck of a good time. Well, they're having a good time up front, too. Here's Cale Yarborough trying to take the lead. On the outside from number 90, Richard Brooks. Cale going into first. Oh, that is Flock and Donnie Allison getting together, going to turn three. Donnie Allison, number one, right back up the middle. He gets hit by Paul Goldsmith. Wild racing in this lap on this restart. There's Derek Coke looking on and trying to learn something. Best thing here to do is how to avoid. And there is 67-year-old Tim Flock getting airborne as he tangled with Donnie Allison going into three. Now watch this. And Allison goes in a little too fast, goes on the outside of Paul Goldsmith in number 99, but Allison loses it, gets tapped by Goldsmith. 
Allison spins on around into the grass. Good night, nurse. Cale Yarborough out in front, and it's Richard Childress that's taken over in second spot. The number three car, the man that now owns Dale Earnhardt's automobile, is going to the outside for a pass. But that won't work. He Ooh. spins around and collects Brooks, and Elmo Langley tags him in car number 64, but the fans are going wild. Let's take a look at it again. Well, Childress just simply went in too fast on the outside, and the car wouldn't stick. And he spins around and, of course, takes the others with him. The car owner, Richard Childress, can't blame Dale Earnhardt for that one. Well, Dick Brooks had led most of this race, Ken, until a couple of laps ago, but now he's in the pits with a flat tire. There's Richard Childress clambering out of car number three, longtime Winston Cup veteran, but better known now as the car owner of the defending Winston Cup champion. Take a look at that action one more time. Number 90, Brooks goes down, and Almo Langley's car just barely getting through it. Let's go down to the pits. Neil Bonnet standing by. Richard, you know, you probably made the biggest gains of anybody out there coming all the way from the rear, and the one time the opportunity was there, you had to try it on the outside, didn't you? Yeah, I knew I could never get him on the inside, and I figured if I could pin him in behind a slow car, I could get him, and I just tried too hard to run out of brains, I guess. No, it's just the old racer in you coming out, man. You're getting back in that thing feeling good. Yeah, I knew it wasn't but about four laps to go, and if I didn't do it there, I might not get another shot. Well, it looks like Earnhardt got a hold of those front fenders, so you're in good shape. You can get back to him now. Yeah, that, he taught that car everything it knew. He taught it how to go to the front. <laughs> go ahead, go, Richard. <laughs> Here's Cale Yarborough with four laps to go, leading here in the Battle of the NASCAR Legends. Of course, checking the competition out the rearview mirror. As he comes down for a start, Alvin Langley is now in second place. He's worked his way from 16th on the starting grid up into second, and guess who's here? Junior Johnson trying it up on the outside again and still banging. Whoever put the camera in his car made the right call. Battle for the lead. It's number 11, Yarborough out on the point. And in second spot, number 64, Almo Langley, down to the inside. Gets into the side of Yarborough. And Kale gets it straightened up. He's going to continue on in first place. Well, I tell you, Kale did a whale of a job of keeping that car straight. He was almost all the way around. Just look at him turning the steering wheel, looking around to see where Elmo is, then looks up in the rearview mirror and keeps trucking. Lap and a half to go. Yarborough in first, Elmo Langley in second, as they get ready to decide this battle of the veterans. White flag is out, one remaining. Cale Yarborough out in front, dives down into turn number one. Elmo Langley hangs right on to the bottom of the racetrack in number 64. For turn three, final time. Elmo Langley's there, drives it down to the bottom, holds its position, stays on the bottom, and he's got Cale Yarborough out of the groove. Elmo Langley's going to win it. Elmo Langley in 64 who hasn't won a race since 1966 when he won in Manassas, Virginia, has won the battle of the NASCAR legends. What a move he put on Kale going into turn three, got completely up beside of him, buffed him a little bit, got the traction he needed coming off of turn four and to the checkered play. Ned, it was Elmo Langley who gave us that lesson earlier in how to move people around out there. And here's Kale Yarborough taking off the goggles, 83-time winner smiling after taking second place. You don't see that very often. Not really when Cale Yarborough finishes second and laughing. He's really having a great time. And that's the look of the winner, number 64. You know what the losers look like. Well, Neil Bonnet is making his way to victory lane for our winner's interview with Almo Langley here at Charlotte in the Battle of the NASCAR Legends. Stay tuned for the victory lane ceremony when we return. Marvin Pant. Pete Hamilton. Attention veterans ages 30 to 69. No matter how you served, whether behind a desk or supporting the front line, please listen to this important message. How much do you think life insurance would cost for a veteran who served as an engineer squad leader in Vietnam? A dollar a week. How much do you think that same insurance would cost a Spec 4 serving in Korea during the 60s? A dollar a week. Or a fighter pilot with the reserves, a dollar a week. A tank mechanic during Desert Storm, a dollar a week. Or a wife of a GI in World War II, a dollar a week. So now ask yourself this question. No matter how you served, if you're a veteran between the ages of 30 and 69, how much will life insurance cost you? A dollar a week. And how much coverage will that buy you? Probably more than you think. Call this number now. Based on the information you provide us, we'll send you absolutely free a personalized, easy-to-read proposal. 
clearly outlining how much coverage you can get. There's no cost or obligation. It's your advantage for being a veteran. Call now and you'll discover these other features. Coverage that will never go down over the life of the policy. Coverage that's also available for your spouse for just a dollar a week. Coverage that in most cases requires no medical exam. Coverage that can cover funeral costs, replace income and pay bills for your family. So whether you were a first lieutenant in Korea, a grunt in Vietnam, a reservist in California, or a squad leader in Operation Desert Storm, you're eligible to apply for term life for just a dollar a week. No matter how you served, picture yourself getting your own personalized life insurance proposal by calling now. Veterans, their spouses or widows ages 30 to 69, call 1-800-327-8300 for your free insurance proposal. There's no cost or obligation, and only veterans can apply for this term life insurance that costs as little as $1 a week. 1-800-327-8300, the one number to call now. The battle is over, and here we are at the Victory Lane Ceremony with Neil Bonnet and the winner of our first Legends race, Elmo Langley. Elmo, you know, it's been a while since you've been in a race car, but you jumped on them guys and really got after them today. Man, I tell you, this, this is great. I can't even tell you how this feels, you know. Uh, I never knew where this victory circle was in Charlotte. You know, I've been to a couple of them, a lot of them in the modifieds and stuff, but, uh, you know, I was, they all, you know, were kind of serious about that. They were kind of driving rough, so at last I seen an opportunity to win, and I, I don't see nothing wrong with that, do you? No, you know, there it looks like you got into Kale, and then you let him get straightened back out, yeah. and then you made another run at him there. I backed off and let him get straight that one time when I got him sideways. You know, when I got him again, I said, you know, I had him out then. I didn't have no reason to back off. You don't get to run that much, but these guys have to follow you every Sunday on that Worcester Cup circuit. You put them to following you today. Well, I tell you, this is great. I can't tell you how much, Neil. You know how great it is. Pace car driver Elmo Langley becomes a race car champion today. Here's Charlie Harville. Junior, did you have a big time? Yeah, I had a rest bar of fun. It was, you know, uh, brought back a lot of memories of the old Saturday night shootouts. <laughs> <laughs> you looked like you were in a Saturday night shootout. Your car was a wreck after about five left. Did you accidentally bump the pace car and Bill France at one point? Nah, they run into me. I was holding <laughs> the groove, and they tried to take it away from me. That, that was the problem. I noticed that after you hit the pace car, though, Bill France Jr. got out of it and let somebody else drive it. Well, he was on the right side. That was the side I was trying to get to. <laughs> well, Jr. will have his own show next year. Watch your local listings. <laughs> and his first guest will be the man that's standing by with Charlie Harville right now, Tim Flock. You had some early trouble. What happened to you, Tim? Bud Moore got me. He spun right on that straight away. I mean, completely around. I couldn't miss him and went right into him, and it messed my steering up. But it, the car was running good after that. Did you? Junior Johnson got me one time. And I didn't mean to, but I got Junior back. I think it might have blowed his tire. You didn't really intend oh, to do no, that. Oh, no. No, I wouldn't have touched nobody out there for nothing. <laughs> Here's a look at the final standings. Tim Flock got himself 10th. Junior Johnson was 11th. We'll be back to meet Kale Yarborough in a moment. Battle of the NASCAR Legends has been brought to you by Snickers Bar, the official snack food sponsor of the 1992 U.S. Olympic team. And by Champion Spark Plugs, the world's number one selling spark plug, no matter what you drive. And by Stanley Tool Works. Since 1843, Stanley has been helping people do things right. Snickers Bar, the official snack food sponsor of the 1992 U.S. Olympic team. Packed with fresh roasted peanuts, thick milk chocolate, and caramel, Snickers satisfies the hunger inside you. Richard Petty, the only driver ever to win 200 Winston Cup races, all on champion spark plugs. Sure. Your help out here really does make a difference in the way I run. Well, Richard, this is our testing ground. It makes a difference in the way we build our spark plugs, too. They work for me in both my cars, whether I'm racing or going home. I depend on Champion spark plugs. Champion, no matter what you drive. 
Richard Petty and Food Line are celebrating 35 years in business. Right. And to commemorate Richard Petty's fan appreciation tour, Food Line is offering one of these four card packs before each of the 29 Winston Cup races. Each pack contains photographs of my career, plus a Food Line cover card for each track. They're available only at Food Lion and for only 99 cents. So before each Winston Cup race, pick up a pack from this spatial display. Watch it, Tom. That thing's dangerous. Oh, pizza. Hey! Rookies. Well, Cale Yarborough, who was shouldered out of first place on the last lap, is already back in his transporter. Let's go down there now. Cale, uh, you've done today what you've always done. Run to the front and try to win it. Well, that's what it's all about. You know, I thought I had it won. I didn't know Elmo was anywhere around, but that's the way it goes. He caught me napping, and he beat me fair and square. Well, thank you, Cale Yarborough. So this celebration of NASCAR legends concludes. Damn. Too often, the glory of another time cannot be recaptured. But today was different. For a few moments, the fire in the belly flared brightly again, and the competitive spirit endured beyond the slim waists and the clear eyes. As they did before, these magnificent old war horses seized the imagination of the crowd and the respect of those who had picked up their batons. There'll be some aching bones and sore muscles tonight, but as the engines fall silent at the Charlotte Motor Speedway, a few more memories have roared into the lore of NASCAR racing. As these old NASCAR legends will remain forever young. You know, I watch these guys race, race hard, and I'm proud. I know these men, these men that came before me. For now, I'm really enjoying the rest of my time as an active racer on the Winston Cup circuit. When that's over and I become a NASCAR legend, if that's what the powers that be decide, if I can be like these guys, it won't be too bad. It won't be too bad at all. For Ken Squire, Chris Economaki, Ned Jarrett, Neil Bonnet, and Charlie Harville, I'm Richard Petty. Thanks for watching.